Okay. The temptation here is to talk about the cult of celebrity, and I do want to do that, but I don't think I can point to it like it's the issue here. Not when there's this wretched, entangled, rat king of issues. Like, the whole question here feels like lifting up a knot of tails in the hopes of untangling them, only to find terrified, screaming rodents underneath your busy fingers. So I think we should take some time to consider our attention economy, and how it interplays with everything that's happened so far, and will interplay with everything that will happen. But it is neither a chapter in the growth of fascist ideas in our cultural mainstream, nor is it the secret at the heart of it all. It is, however, vitally important to understand what is happening. And what is happening is very, very important. I shot my wife in Nova Geisel. I buried her in Germany. On October 6, 2022, white supremacist bowtie dipshit Tucker Carlson released an interview with rapper Kanye West, now going by Ye, in which the artist explained his motivation for promoting the white supremacist slogan White Lives Matter on merch at a show. In unreleased clips from the Carlson interview, Ye made a series of extreme comments about Jewish people, including promoting the central black Israelite idea that black people are the true descendants of the lost tribes of Israel, and more disturbingly that Jewish people promote Planned Parenthood to control the growth and behavior of the black population. The decision to Remove these more extreme statements but still air the rest of the interview brought Carlson enormous criticism from a variety of political commentators. On October 8th, Ye tweeted, I'm a bit sleepy tonight, but when I wake up, I'm going Death Con 3 on Jewish people. The funny thing is, I actually can't be anti Semitic because black people are actually Jew. Also, you guys have toyed with me and tried to blackball anyone who ever opposes your agenda. On October 17th, it was announced that Ye was in talks to purchase Parler, the far right social media platform belonging to the husband of Candace Owens, professional fascist liar an occasional friend to Ye during his years-long spiral into conservative conspiracism. Free speech warrior, associate of Ghislaine Maxwell, and dangerously irresponsible blood money fortune inheritor Elon Musk shared a meme in a now-deleted tweet suggesting that this purchase would somehow result in a fusion between Twitter and Parler. On October 22nd, anti-Semites unfold a banner on an overpass in Los Angeles that said, Kanye was right about the Jews, while Beverly Hills residents that same weekend received anti-Semitic literature promoting conspiracy theories broadly in line with statements that West has made both before and since. On October 25th, amid growing public pressure, sports are company Adidas cancelled their long-running partnership with Ye, costing both the brand and the rapper figures somewhere in the tens of millions of dollars. On November 22nd, Ye reportedly had dinner with former President Donald Trump and white supremacist Nick Fuentes, where according to Ye, he asked Trump to be his running mate in a presidential campaign that he formally announced on November 25th. November 28th, Ye appeared on Tim Pool's podcast with Nick Fuentes and Milo Yiannopoulos, where Pool, a far-right slug masquerading as a liberal centrist, provided light questioning of Ye's anti-Semitism, prompting the rapper to storm out of the interview. On December 1st, West appeared on Alex Jones's network Infowars, where he said that he loves Hitler and repeated various Nazi talking points, for instance, that Hitler invented highways. He did not. Following the interview and the enormous social media backlash, Ye posted a picture of a swastika inside a Star of David, for which Elon Musk publicly deliberated over banning West, as Musk's proclaimed new free speech policies on Twitter came into conflict with his personal friend inciting violence on a platform with 31 million followers. After seeing that Musk was talking about banning him, Ye posted a picture of Musk looking pale and out of shape with his shirt off next to Ari Emanuel, a Jewish businessman with whom Ye seems to have developed a deep obsession. Following this tweet, West was banned from Twitter. Piers Morgan, careerist spineless little worm whose bones are composed from the sands of fallen empires, said that he had been texting with Ye and that the rapper is just trying to be as offensive as possible. On December 5th, Gavin McInnes released a trailer for a series titled Saving Ye, in which he claimed to have flown out to talk to West two days after the Infowars interview. Two days later, McInnes released a 40 minute interview on his site Censored.tv, where he mostly lets West rant on unopposed, with occasional questions and an interlude where he talks to Fuentes for a few minutes. At this point, Ye's I Love Hitler shirt is raising a lot of questions that should be answered by his shirt, but I would like to explore a few sides of this in a little more depth. So maybe we can take a moment and breathe and ask ourselves, what the fuck is going on? We need to clear out a few cobwebs before we can do a proper analysis of the full court press that the right-wing media organism is doing around Ye right now. So lots of people have been talking about his mental health, and in particular his bipolar diagnosis. It's worth stating clearly that bipolar disorder and poor mental health more broadly doesn't cause anti-Semitism. But there is some nuance to observe here. Since we live in a society rife with bigotry and anti-Semitism and anti-blackness that Ye has experienced firsthand, and the conspiratorial thinking that is central to anti-Semitism quite frequently relies on emotional reasoning and associative blending. So someone who holds anti-Semitic beliefs already, 
who is experiencing extremely poor mental health will be way harder to appeal to based on evidence that contradicts their motivated reasoning. So, it's important to strike a balance between acknowledging the ways that Ye's apparent extreme, extended, and evolving mental health crisis has exacerbated this situation, and maintaining his culpability for his own beliefs and actions. What a lot of people are doing when they talk about West's mental health is effectively imagining an alternate Kanye West who never did any of the things that they find upsetting, or trying to evoke a, someone else who had not fallen into his current psychodramatic malaise. West himself acknowledges the almost teleological split in observers' cultural perceptions of him as different instantiated persons across his career, especially in his track, I Miss the Old Kanye. The track is called I Love Kanye, the, the first lyric is I, uh, I Miss the Old Kanye, my bad. This is effectively an exercise in trying to understand why people do bad things, and it could be compared to how people talk about school shootings, but ultimately, we have the Ye West we have in real life, and it is his actions and their consequences that actually matter. One place it is worthwhile to consider Ye's mental health is in the discussion of the ways in which white supremacists are taking advantage of him and his still enormous platform, while maintaining that he is authentically an anti-Semite and his agency as a whole person, we can see that a few fascists weekend at Bernie'sing a mentally ill celebrity across their media platforms for attention can do a lot of damage very, very quickly. Another place it's worthwhile is in reflexively understanding what it is Ye actually believes. What is it that he says that aligns with what he thinks is true, since so much of this debacle has been widespread bafflement and confusion, helped in no small part by the fact that part of what West is doing is deliberate absurdist trolling. But which part? We can use an analytical approach to suggest what he is saying sincerely, and what he is saying that is willful gibberish. As for Piers Morgan's claim that Ye is just trying to be as offensive as possible, we, we should probably start with Jean-Paul Sartre's famous quote about anti-Semites. Never believe that anti-Semites are completely unaware of the absurdity of their replies. They know that their remarks are frivolous, open to challenge, but they are amusing themselves, for it is their adversary who is obliged to use words responsibly, since he believes in words. The anti-Semites have the right to play, they even like to play with discourse, for by giving ridiculous reasons, they discredit the seriousness of their interlocutors. They delight in acting in bad faith, since they seek not to persuade by sound argument, but to intimidate and disconcert. If you press them too closely, they will abruptly fall silent. Island, loftily indicating by some phrase that the time for argument is past. This is true. We, the left, the people who should stand up for Jews against anti-Semitism, are obliged to use words responsibly. So, let's put a few responsible words in order to explain why West believes the anti-Semitic things that he says. Throughout the recent wave of interviews, Ye has repeatedly diverted the conversation to ramble about pornography, which he says is both a cancerous presence inflicted upon society by the Jews, and responsible for the dissolution of his marriage. Although light on the details, Ye refers to himself as having had a porn addiction, and to his ex-wife Kim Kardashian as being somehow involved in the culture of pornography that he came to despise. This all reads as a kind of resentful response to interpersonal conflict. He repeatedly says that Instagram is pornography, which he ties into a wider conspiracy theory, which is a historic and commonplace anti-Semitic belief that Jews control the media, and control people involved in the media through control of their images. Okay, so Ye doesn't want his image controlled by the Jews, hence the Zodiac Killer drip. Part of this motivation, understood through the lens of public meltdown, is understandable. Or at least I can understand it. Earlier this year, I didn't release any new videos for several months, and part of the reason why was that I knew I was soon going to be having facial feminization surgery, and the idea of putting out new images of myself into the world that didn't match up to my mental image of myself became very painful. Putting a pin in his racist interpretation of the world around him for a second, it is clear that Ye is suffering an acute dissonance between himself and the person people see when they look at him. I say all of this to refute the Piers Morgan interpretation. No, he's not just trying to be as offensive as possible, and his outfit is evidence of that. What he says about Jews controlling people through their images 
is an authentically held belief. On the other hand, when Ye says that he loves everyone as an explanation for why he just said he loves Hitler, this is obviously trolling. He's going from interview to interview denying the Holocaust, spreading anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, refusing to criticize the Nazis and Hitler in any way, and attacking both individual Jews and what he sees as the crimes of a global Jewish conspiracy. Okay, we'll get into all that more a bit later, but maybe a better example of out-and-out -out absurdist trolling are his comments on Elon Musk. Complaining on Instagram about recently being banned from Twitter, Ye wrote, Am I the only one who thinks Elon could be half Chinese? Have you ever seen his pics as a child? Take a Chinese genius and mate them with a South African supermodel and we have an Elon. I say an Elon because they probably made 10 to 30 Elons and he's the first genetic hybrid that stuck. Well, let's not forget about Obama. Never believe that the anti-Semite is completely unaware of the absurdity of their replies. I am curious. Uh, you talked already about like, how some of the response has been from outside either community, or just to be clear, white people being shitty. Uh, <laughs> I am shocked. Um, but like, uh, what about kind of how have you have you experienced any conversations um, with other black people about this? Where how much have you seen people who are amenable to where Kanye is taking this? Not not very much. It's kind of like a just a so like Jewish and black people historically have had to be in community with each other. Of course. Right. Generally speaking, aside from like people within that space, there's not an engagement with Jewish people as Jewish from a black perspective, but more so these are just white people we're in community with. Mm. And sometimes they will do white people shit and sometimes they won't. Sure. <laughs> it's really what it's really what it seems like. Like Dave, not Dave. What's the uh, Chris Rock had mm. a great joke at, at a certain point about uh, some anti-Semitist shit. He was like, "Black people don't hate Jewish people. Black people hate white people," and like that's a very like cogent thing to engage with. The, the I think the the thing to think about is there has been for years probably since the 50s and 60s and the and the the last the 60s and 70s i should say in the last throes of black um a real black nationalist leftist movements as these caricatures we often call hoteps have emerged there's always been a like small pocket of black uh political identitarians etc that have tried to peddle anti-semitic Semitic, uh, Semitic uh, elements to their ideology Mm -hmm. And if you pay attention to black culture, we have always mocked them. They've never gotten a foothold in terms of right. popular black thought. Yeah. Um, you, I can send you a million different examples from the 80s to now of us mocking that caricature. Yeah. Uh, and it's not until just now. That's why it's so funny. People are like, oh, my God, it's growing. It's like, no, these guys have been here for a while. Unlike <laughs> y'all, we know how to handle our shit. Scumbag grifters. So here we'll look a little bit at the interview with Tim Pool, where Ye is accompanied by Milo Yiannopoulos and Nick Quentes. Tim Pool made over $5,000 from this stream from donations and super chats, where chatter messages read, for example, at the end of every conspiracy is a Jew. Movies, music, finance, gov, NGOs, military contractors, sports, etc. You refuse to even consider it. They don't do it. They fund and coordinate it every time. And not to leave it unsaid, YouTube made over $2,000 from these same chat donations. Nick Fuentes, first time here on the Timcast. Thank you for having me. Nick Fuentes is an anti-Semite and fascist who frequently expresses support for a complete authoritarian dictatorship with laws based on biblical literalism. He identifies as a Catholic, which isn't even a real gender, and says that this is what informs his politics first and foremost, but a more educated study of Fuentes would suggest that his time on neo-Nazi child porn enthusiast messaging board 4chan slash B has informed his beliefs and central ideology far more. He goes to great lengths to explain that he doesn't identify as a Nazi, which should probably explain a great deal and to not leave it unsaid, he is a Holocaust denier, and in keeping with the Sartre quote about the anti-Semites, we can't meaningfully determine the depth of his hatred for Jewish people, because in Fuentes' own words, he never actually tells the truth about how extreme his beliefs really are. In fact, Fuentes says he doesn't call himself a Nazi or a white nationalist for tactical reasons. All right. And of course, Milo, you were here a couple weeks ago. 
Yes, I'm your best ever guest. Milo Yiannopoulos is an opportunistic grifter in the far-right politics sphere who first came to prominence through the rise of the alt-right and Donald Trump in 2016 while he was working for fascist media site Breitbart. Yiannopoulos' career of trolling in the media and baiting university students into time-wasting arguments for content was cut short by a concerted campaign to deplatform him, made easier by the fact that Yiannopoulos publicly defended paedophilia, after which Milo declared bankruptcy in 2018. Since then, trying to regain a foothold in the far-right media and politics world, Milo has pulled a series of petty stunts, including using the mystique of his deteriorating brand to auction off his set pieces and personal effects. His most recent attempt at clawing back clout by joining Ye's campaign ended on December 5th when Yiannopoulos confirmed on Telegram that he and Ye were parting ways. Milo claims the decision is mutual, though many in his social circle have suggested that it is the result of a failed power play against Fuentes with whom Ye has recently become inseparable. <laughs> so we, we've been told that uh, the episode with you was one of the best podcasts ever. People really I, enjoyed I hearing you speak. I think that's accurate. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks for coming thanks, back. Thanks. I was wondering how I was going to uh, make it even more extraordinary the second time I visited, but I think I might have pulled it off. Addressing the dinner with former President Trump, he says early in the interview, When Trump came in, we were, I said, do you want to sit alone? He's like, no, bring your friends in. So a big thing is like Trump had no idea who Nick Fuentes was. Which may well be true. Donald Trump has frequently demonstrated caring very little about the simpering cronies who adore him and prop up his fascist political power, but if it is true, it demonstrates one of the biggest leaps forward for Nick's openly fascist agenda. His association with Ye got him a seat at the table with the most famous fascist in the world today, where he got to explicitly request that they work together on future political endeavors. It is undeniable that Fuentes sees Ye as a free ride to spread Nazi talking points to Trump, to Trump's cult-like political following, and to a broader mainstream, and to build on that, Tim Pool is a facilitator of that project by allowing them a space to discuss it publicly. Pool has 1.4 million subscribers on YouTube. Well, let's look at the facts of what I'm saying, though. If you say in this neighborhood where they gerrymander, there's this amount of time. So, hey, I wasn't doing that. I was just gerrymandering the lawyers and the Hollywood executives <laughs> and the people at the bank that debanked me and then froze my accounts. So something that makes all of this harder is that Ye is politically illiterate to the point of farce. Like when he says that he's just gerrymandering all of the Jews together, using the way that minorities are legislated into voting districts to reduce the influence of their voting power as a metaphor for the way that he is associating the actions of individual Jewish people with some kind of innate quality of old Jews. That doesn't make any fucking sense. I sat with this one for a while. I tried to write it more eloquently, more descriptively, in a way that would unpack the way that it doesn't make sense. But it's just fucking gibberish. It just demonstrates that he doesn't understand gerrymandering as a term or a process. Anyway, the interview chugs along like this for about 20 minutes until Poole says that he doesn't want to say that the they West keeps referring to are the Jews and Ye storms out of the room to sulk like a child. Are you leaving? Are you afraid of the press? He's gone. That's nearly all there is to say about this interview, but I do want to comment that if Poole represents any sense of the liberal mainstream, of what the centrist pushback to anti-Semitism and fascism is, then the centrist resistance to anti-Semitism is just anti-Semitism itself. Inviting Yiannopoulos and Fuentes on your show so that Yiannopoulos can tell your audience that Fuentes is the greatest political commentator of his generation is doing phenomenal harm to the safety of the Jewish community. It's actively streaming your audience towards a white supremacist Holocaust denier. Paul's discomfort with what West is desperate to say about the Jews is anesthetized by the opioid effects of the profits he knows that he will make from hosting this desperate clown show on his platform, and that makes him, at best, a spineless bystander to the violence he knows will result from his actions, and at worst, a fascist very poorly pretending to be a liberal. I understand there's a concern about publicizing individual events to, like, A, it draws the attention of the people who are meaning to harm people to begin with, uh, B, when people like Alex Jones are directly involved, families of victims are not safe. Um, and then there's also, like, the, the risk of inspiring more violence. So I'm not necessarily yeah. asking to, like, um, drive at anything in particular, but, like, what... Do you, do you think that Jewish people are less safe because of 
Yay. I... I... Maybe. I... Um... So in Los Angeles, in... I, I live in Los Angeles. It's a big fuck-off city. But mm -hmm. a thing that I have observed while living here for the last, like, three years is that um, pretty much since the pits I, was it Pittsburgh? The Tree of Life synagogue shooting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, most synagogues, you should you would have to call ahead because the doors are locked. You can't oh, God. walk into a shoal anymore. Right which is very sad um yeah in my experience i mm -hmm. i can pass you know so mm -hmm. like if i'm not wearing a mug and david necklace mm -hmm. or something you know yeah. wearing a big t-shirt that says jewish heritage foundation on it or whatever the fuck um nobody's gonna know but like i want to do some volunteer work and there is an awareness that walking into an openly Jewish um, organization puts a target on your back. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's worse. I, it's It's been a thing that's been a thing for the last like four years, I would say. Every human being has something of value that they brought to the table. Especially Hitler. How about that one? Ari Emanuel, how you like that one? Hey, Ron, you going to do anything to fix Chicago? Well, I am worried about the thousands of black folks down a month in Chicago. But, but let me expand on that because that's a nuanced issue. Yeah. You know, my, 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 my grandfather. Alex Jones is a far-right conspiracy theory grifter notorious for involvement in the Obama birther movement, 9-11 trutherism, propping up Trump's election campaigns, the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol building, and the dishonest reporting that instigated the harassment of the parents of children killed at the mass shooting at Sandy Hook. One woman who had already lost her child in a school shooting was harassed so constantly that she had to move home seven times and couldn't visit the grave of her dead son, making her experience along with her other parents harassed because of Jones one of the most incomprehensible stochastic horrors of our modern age. Jones Jones, despite discomfort, shock, and disbelief in some of the clips shared virally on social media where he is reacting to Ye's anti-Semitism, is not deserving of your sympathy. He may never deserve sympathy again. Um, Ye simply cannot stop talking about his personal grievances. Porn, Ari Emanuel, Phil Knight, across any of these interviews. And the point was, my grandfather saw that, so I, I understand you're opposed to other forces, but I don't think then thinking other forces in history that are lionized, that's my personal experience of what my grandfather, uh, Clyde William Hammond, told me. Does that make sense? It, it, not totally to me, but um, it's, and I'm not saying that to be disrespectful, I'm saying like it literally doesn't totally make sense to me. I'm following it. But I, I was just thinking about Satan. In the InfoWars interview, he is clearly getting bored very quickly and reverting the topic back to whatever he wanted it to be about. It's been said that this is in line with him suffering a prolonged egocentric manic episode, but whether this is true or not, it's equally true that this is in line with a very famous but not very intelligent and frankly infantile personality surrounded by yes men who find it politically and professionally expedient to strike a balance between tolerating his gibberish and using him to have the racist discussion to which they are trying to give oxygen. The conversation is interesting to Ye for as long as it's about him and his life, which means that people willing to pander to those needs can keep benefiting from his anti-Semitism and his platform, and using him to further spread Nazi ideas and talking points. It seems that Ye was in touch with Alex Jones for a while, who then put him in touch with Yiannopoulos, who then put him in touch with Fuentes. They say this explicitly in the pool interview, but we'll discuss it in the context of Infowars. Jones, who has hosted Fuentes on his show before, seems to be scrambling to understand his new relationship to his younger colleague. Fuentes said in a live stream that his appearance on Infowars with West was the best day of his life, and made a point of saying that the first time he went on Infowars, Jones told him to downplay the Jew thing because it would be harmful to the brand. A few days after the interview with Ye and Fuentes together, Jones had Fuentes back on the show on his own via video call, supposedly to debate Nick on his anti-Semitic beliefs. My show's a lot more focused on, you know, what you might call the Jewish question, which is what are we to do about this Jewish elite, these Jewish gangsters that run our Christian country? These and, and, I don't think, and, and, and I think that's a debate that should be had because... When it comes to the Jews, here's the silver lining. It tends to go from zero to 60. Like, they're not wrong about that. 
But there's a reason for that, and the reason is them. <laughs> okay. It has been observed multiple times before that Fuentes possesses what some call uh, enormous yaoi hands, which are incredibly distracting when he speaks because he makes a conscious effort to imitate the hand gestures of Donald Trump. all the Talmuds in Paris, okay? It never starts that way. <laughs> but frequently... The purpose of this discussion, it is flagrantly obvious, is not a debate or an attempt at refuting anti-Semitic beliefs. Jones is trying to triangulate his new position in relation to Fuentes, since Fuentes is now so close to Ye, whose platform Jones and the other far-right grifters covet, and Fuentes' influence over Ye lies somewhere between feeding the rapper Nazi talking points and controlling which media appearances he accepts or declines. To reinforce this point, in the InfoWars interview, West said he hadn't heard of Benjamin Netanyahu until two weeks prior. So you don't like Benjamin Netanyahu? <laughs> I just, I, I just heard about this guy two weeks ago since like the tweet, and I thought he had a funny name. Despite not having heard of Netanyahu until two weeks ago, West apparently found him important enough to bring a whole prop comedy bit into the interview, where he displays a net for cleaning a fish tank and a bottle of YooHoo, which together makes apparently Net and Yahoo. I don't get into group politics. Adam, I've got, I mean, sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to say that. Uh, uh, Alex. Yes, sir. Um, I've got the perfect answer for the ADL. They are going to have to listen up. What we did is we brought Netanyahu with us. Ah. <laughs> I mean, this is, I'm in the twilight zone right now. Netanyahu, what do you have to say? What do you have to say to Alex Jones right now, Nick Fuentes and Ye? It was bad. It was bad for Trump to meet with Nick and Ye. Okay. Much of the interview follows a pattern of Ye going on a rant about his personal grievances and his warped views of sexuality and social media while relating it back to his bigoted conspiracy theories, and then Jones and Fuentes trying to interpret it through the lens of talking points with which their respective audiences will already be familiar, the driving tension being that Jones wants Fuentes and West to use some kind of coded language like the globalists or international bankers, but both of them are determined to make their anti-Semitism as explicit as possible, and then after some of this back and forth, Ye gets bored again and drags the conversation back to either his grievances, or some asinine shit he's reading off his phone, or more of the Net and Yahoo puppet show. One of West's prepared bits for the interview is a list of jokes about Ben Shapiro that he attributes to impressively unfunny hack Owen Benjamin. I got some uh, jokes here from uh, Owen Benjamin that I want to read about Ben Shapiro. In actuality, these are obviously just very old anti-Semitic jokes, and Benjamin has just swapped out Ben Shapiro in place of Jews, or a Jew. And also, Ye doesn't seem to understand the material he's reading. Like, he says shackles instead of shackles. I think he maybe doesn't know the word shackles. As InfoWars Monitoring and Analysis podcast Knowledge Fight has pointed out, Alex Jones and Owen Benjamin are on extremely poor terms, and the flagrance with which West can bring up Owen Benjamin and just tell his jokes in front of Jones really speaks to the desperation that Jones feels to host the rapper on his show. As an aside, Listening to Knowledge Fight makes you a sexier and more charismatic person, and it also upsets Alex Jones. Lots of people reacting to clips of the InfoWars interview are saying things like, I never thought I'd feel sorry for Alex Jones, or you know you're really fucked up when even Alex Jones is saying, not sure about that one, chief. And on top of what I've already said about Jones not deserving your sympathy, I'd like to caution against interpreting any of the clips this way. Alex Jones is a profit-seeking algorithm, represented in the physical world by a cartoon red-faced man stolen from a PSA about alcohol and cocaine abuse. He does not care on a moral level about what West is saying or the violence that it will inspire. If his audience is into it, he will lean into it further, but in the meantime he just has to protect his brand and his legal liability. He has spent years creating a platform where he's hosted people like Fuentes, and then he introduced Ye into his social circle, and then hosted them back on his show, and is delighted by the attention and therefore money it is getting him. This is absolutely lit. This is lit, 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 lit. Number one show in the world right now. Everybody's tuned in everywhere. Ye, everybody, I appreciate you being here. We're gonna go to break. We're gonna come back and play that little my favorite promo with Ye. And then we're going to air the Trudeau clip, and then we'll go right back to Ye. Stay with us. We're here. So this is uh, this is Saturday afternoon, two days after the InfoWars interview. 
Gavin McInnes founded the Proud Boys, a widespread and extremely violent fascist street gang operating across America. The Proud Boys membership have produced Proud Boys merch that says 6MWE, that stands for 6 million wasn't enough to be clear, and is a popular neo-Nazi slogan. McInnes for his part tried to limply distance himself from the gang when he realised that having founded a violent fascist street gang might have legal repercussions for him personally, but has never meaningfully distanced himself from the politics they practice, and anti-Semitism is readily apparent throughout his work even today and even in this interview. McInnes' saving Ye is at absolute best, a naive attempt to course correct Ye's meltdown into something that people with politics more like McGuinness can profit from instead of Fuentes, and more likely a coordinated media opportunity for Fuentes' Nazi ideas in which McInnes sits down with Ye and asks, what would you do about the Jews? Frankly, the question of whether McInnes is just stupid or just racist can only lead us back to the fact that he founded the Proud Boys, so not really any closer to an answer, but I see no particular reason to give the washed up hack turned fascist scumbag the benefit of the doubt. And I was just telling you before we started filming that we were watching it at home and Ryan and I were just looking at each other about every 20 minutes. We'd... The interview with Gavin McInnes is honestly shockingly somehow worse than the InfoWars interview, with Gavin McInnes beginning the interview by praising how Ye praised Hitler. The biggest reaction, the most positive one is, it's the craziest, most punk rock thing since the Sex Pistols got kicked off the Bill Grundy show. But on the other end of the spectrum, people are saying this is, uh, this is bad for a presidential campaign, to say the least. Framing the downside to it only as a potential harm to his presidential campaign, like, the only bad side of this is a harm to Ye's potential ambitions and not the real world violence it's going to cause to real people. And Gavin goes on from this to say that he is going to stage an intervention on Ye and Nick for their anti-Semitic beliefs. This is, I'm going to have an intervention here for you and Nick and let me just make a case. One thing that I want to ask about is um, how you feel about Gavin McInnes trying to position himself as if he's going to de-radicalize Kanye away from anti-Semitic views. I mean, I would say that sounds like the punchline to a really shitty joke. <laughs> Fuentes is a committed Nazi whose entire platform is built on promoting Nazism and white supremacy. You can't do an intervention on him any more than you can explain the moral problem with fossil fuels to the ExxonMobil Corporation. In both cases, the only meaningful form of intervention would be one that stops them from operating by any means necessary. But Hitler's got a pretty bad reputation. <laughs> well, who made that reputation? That was made by Jewish people. Well, the murdering Jews was a pretty big part of his bad reputation. Yeah, but some of it's incorrect. Also, the Holocaust is not the only Holocaust. So okay. for them to take that and claim we're in, we have abortion right now, that's, you, that's eugenics, that's genocide. This claim that Hitler's bad reputation came from the Jews is one of the most extreme forms of Holocaust denial that Ye has engaged in so far, and it's quite telling that McInnes, who says he recorded with Ye for five hours, puts it so early in the final edit of the interview. This seems to be marking out who the intended audience is supposed to be. The far-right pundits around West want to keep a white supremacist base invested in what he's saying, and this blatant a denial of basic reality will create a self-selecting filter between people who will be offended enough to switch off when someone says the Jews slandered Hitler, and people who will be open to hearing the rest of the discussion, which is then further compounded by the way that Ye deftly ties this to his anti-abortion rhetoric. The American far right has been pushing for decades to recriminalize abortion, and if there are people watching who are firmly anti-abortion and pigeonholed enough into a weaponized unreality, for instance, QAnon adherents, who in their minds at least are so far undecided on the Jewish question, then this kind of epistemic wedge statement will separate them from people who could prevent them from further anti-Semitic radicalization. Yes, there are... Uh... Almost 80 to 90 percent of Hollywood is Jewish, probably more. It would have been comment worthy on its own a month earlier for McInnes to say something like this, but Ye provides a kind of umbrella for all the fascists he's talking to. They only have to say less extreme things than him in order to not be seen as doing anything wrong. McInnes can frame what he's doing here as saving Ye because he's opposing the statement, I love Hitler. My dad used to tell me that if you're hiking and you encounter a bear, you don't have to be faster than the bear to survive you just have to be faster than your hiking buddy. And I think we can see a bit of the same logic at play here. 
McInnes's brand is built entirely on pretending he is too stupid to understand why everything he does promotes fascism. Tim Pool's brand is built on pretending that all he cares about is preserving the centrist liberal mainstream realm of fair-minded debate. Alex Jones's brand is built on pretending that he's going to expose the authoritarian New World Order globalist elites. None of these people, or more importantly, the characters they play on their TV shows, have to be in more meaningful conflict than you would find on pro-wrestling. None of this is about stopping Ye. In fact, quite the reverse. You know, blacks are overrepresented in violent crime. I also have to say this, and I, I don't want to, but I, I have to, because I, I, I have to know if I'm the only one who thinks this, but like, does this wide shot not really look like a hardcore scene is about to begin? Like, with the mask and the concrete and like the, like, censor.tv? It's like... <laughs> But when you meet an individual black person, you don't apply that. You start with a fresh slate every time you meet someone. Do you do that with Jews? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> this intervention isn't going very well. <laughs> this clip here really puts the lie to the entire notion of the intervention, if anyone was at all even slightly fooled. Gavin is not here to de-radicalize Ye. He's brought Ye and Nick in to laugh with them about how outrageously open they're getting to be about the views that they all share. The next natural step here, provided they get the base they are looking for, and the approval of racists who have been crypto up until this point but are grateful for the cover with which they can open up about being racists, is for McInnes, probably Alex Jones, possibly Tim Pool, to start publicly pondering what if Ye was right about some things, as if they ever meaningfully disagreed. This part of the script was written on December 10th, 2022. Tactically, that's the next move, and the only two ways that it won't be the next move these far-right figures take is if the attention and the base they're aiming for fails to materialize, or if they hesitate too long and other far-right figures with smaller platforms seize the opportunity instead, because this is dictated by a free market logic of attention. The reason it was never a question whether Ye would get a platform to share his ideas on is he gets eyes on their channels, he makes them money. <laughs> The only way that they won't get with his program is if either the attention, and therefore profit, isn't there, or because someone else beats them to it. So it's actually over halfway through the entire interview before Fuentes finally speaks, but interestingly, after Fuentes starts speaking, the interview becomes almost entirely a back and forth between McInnes and Fuentes, since Fuentes understands the talking points and what he's trying to communicate clearly a little better than West does. McInnes has just finished a ramble about how Scotland is ethno-masochistic, because it's the most woke country on earth and has open border policies, and all this is evidence of whites wanting to sabotage themselves. Fuentes says that he doesn't think that white people are ethnomasochistic, he thinks that Jews are enforcing ethnomasochism on white people, and he says that white people don't hate themselves because... If you look at white kids, there's nothing, I don't think, intrinsic in white people that makes them hate themselves. Like, when I was a kid, kids loved Hitler. That's a nightmare statement we need to unpack for a second. He means on 4chan, where the users were in fact adult Nazis pretending to be kids to indoctrinate and groom children to become Nazis, because this is precisely what has happened to Nick. His argument is that Jewish manipulation is the cause of white self-hatred, and in McInnes' statement, Jews are white people, and Jewish people are not to blame for the white ethnomasochism, but in Fuentes' statement, Jews are an outside group who teach the ethnomasochism to white people in order to sabotage them. This might be the first clear ideological conflict in any of the Yay interviews, although McInnes seems extremely passé about anti-Semitism and has been frequently anti-Semitic himself, and again, is the founder of the Proud Boys, so... <laughs> It's anyone's guess, really, whether this is just performative. Later in the interview, Gavin asks Ye how he and a Vice President Fuentes would go about fixing the Jew problem. So, what do you say, Nick, if, if you guys are President, Vice President, well, you're too young, but you know what I mean, hypothetically. How do you institute this when, not if, fixing okay. the Jew problem? Fuentes compounds the conspiracy theory of the Jews controlling the media, and Ye starts insisting Jews shouldn't be in charge of media technology, politics, farming, prisons. He actually says that Jews should not be allowed to employ Christians, and Jews should have to work to Christians, which is easily comparable to the Nuremberg Laws, and arguably promoting a boycott on any Jewish business right now, as well as the inherent incitement to violence in these statements. Ye also says that he would have have a Jewish person work for him if he could completely surveil that Jewish person and make sure that they weren't a spy, to which 
McInnes and Fuentes have a, a haughty laugh. If you do not believe in Christ and you're not following Christ in the decisions that you make, you should have no influence on that. Well, that's going to be a tough thing to institute. So, so you're president of the United States. The, the Hitler thing does not hurt your campaign. First day I, I, in it helps my campaign. Okay, it helps your campaign. Yeah. You're in office. It's day one, and they go, someone walks in, and they go, so what are we going to do about these Jews? What do you say? What do you mean do about them? What, what do you well, is there any action involved? Like, they, they're overly represented in med. Lots of people who don't believe in Christ. I would, I would probably wager that in your average hospital in New York, maybe a third or less believe in Christ. So are you suggesting we get rid of two-thirds of the doctors? Not get rid of, like, not violently get rid of them. Fire I think, them? I think that Jews are very intelligent, but they don't deserve to be in charge of everything because they don't put Christ in. in but the how do you legislate that? They need to work for Christians. Jews should work for Christians. I'll hire a Jewish person in a second. If I knew they weren't a spy and I could look through their phone and follow them to their house and have a camera all in their living room. <laughs> <laughs> Normally conversations about what would you do if you were in power are fairly futile exercises in navel gazing by people who will never have that kind of political power. But in the context of Ye's enormous media presence, let alone his presidential campaign and his proposition for Trump, this is a much more real discussion about policies that could actually be enacted by, if not West, then any dedicated anti-Semite able to seize power in American elections. I'm not American, and I think that this is the context that is needed to get this one is just America. I don't feel like his presidential campaign, if that's happening at any point, like has any hope of getting anyone's votes. Am, is that we voted in Donald Trump? Okay. Why can it not be possible? <laughs> okay. I've had this argument with a couple of people. Okay. I've had this well, argument with a couple that... of people. So what it seems like to me is quite like these Nazis have momentum and the ability to keep like taking him places being like, no, you're definitely the second coming of the Messiah. Like you, you all, every, all of your manic thoughts are real for as long as they keep momentum on the idea that he's going to run for president. Fuentes said that they had met with Trump and that they had a proposition for Trump, um, possibly for, like, Trump to run as his VP, which is... His vice president, yeah. Incredible, incredible brain, incredible mind. It's like a... It's like a, 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 one, a, like a 90s boner comedy. You know what I mean? <laughs> From the fucking yeah. South Park guys. Like, this is a South Park skit. Comes well, that's life. what they said about Trump, right? And then and South Park had to like change all of their plot lines because the Trump was too ridiculous. But um, yeah. uh, which is why I'm like, like you can't you can't <laughs> rule out that and he I, becomes our president. And I do accept that point, but the way in which Trump did become president was surely driven by the building evangelical uh, base in America, right? And like the movement of the conservative side to an increasingly far-right position. And also the so, uh, ways in which like the white working class felt abandoned by the Democratic Party, largely very fairly, because the Democrats don't care about the working class at all. So he's got two of those. He's okay. got the far-right. He, he's, he, he can appeal to the white working class. Um, yeah, okay. The, the evangelicals... Oh no, he's got the evangelicals. <laughs> That's what I'm telling you, Sophie. Okay. Don't jinx us. So, okay, just like so... we were looking at y'all, like there's no way that this Brexit is gonna happen. They're not gonna do that. <laughs> like, like no, our nations yeah. are stupid, Sophie. We live in dumb, dumb times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and it is it is not like is it probable? No, I don't think it'll happen. Yeah, I think the white like white moderates abandoned Trump, and I think they kind of like. It was like, oh, okay, we shouldn't do that. I think that's what happened to my white moderates. So, like, I think that would cancel Kanye out. But, you know, we live in dumb times. And, like, Kanye well, we live in, win. In, yeah, we live in yeah, an so attention I, economy is kind of a big point that I'm getting at. Right. And I, I guess. Yeah, thank you. That's a better way of putting it. I'm just trying to. Because those are the bases, those are the voter bases for Trump. But the biggest factor in, in what was happening in the election cycle was that no one could just shut the fuck up about him. And every time he did something just yes. completely asinine, everyone was like, can you believe he did this really asinine thing? Um, and then more and more politicians would flock to him because they were like, he's getting the attention, so he's going to win. Um, yeah. 
I guess. So, so that that is a yeah. realistic. That's a somewhat realistic thing. It's not an absurd thing. Mm -hmm. Now, this doesn't. Two things can be true at once. Your theory on what the white supremacists are doing is also true. Less than a month after the interview with Ye, Tim Pool found himself being questioned over anti-Semitism again after his co-host went on a rant on the show about how Ye was right and calling Jews not real believers. Crazy it is, is it? Kanye is waking up a bunch of Jewish people and pointing them to God. Like last night on that Gavin Wait, McGinnis what? interview, I'll, I'll explain it. Gavin was like, I don't <laughs> know think... about that one, Ian. Yeah, Gavin's like, because Nick was saying, oh, there's a cabal, or they were saying there's a cabal of people that are preventing Kanye from, you know, get, getting to another echelon of wealth or whatever. There's a cabal. And Kanye's like, it's the Jewish people. And uh, Gavin was like, I, I don't think they're Jewish. If you don't yeah. believe in God, you're not Jewish. And it's something I said last week, too. So, Gavin, if you're listening, hell yeah, dude, nice one. And it's true. Word means. That you're Jewish, meaning what? That you're a Jew, it, meaning what? It, it, that you it, believe in God. That's the tenet of Judaism. That That's like the tenet. There's there's going to be a, a revelation within Judaism. There's going to be some sort of a transformation where people come back to the faith. And it, Kanye will be looked at as someone that saved the Jews. Oh, would you look at that? It's the consequences of my actions. Paul represents an interesting element at play here because I think weighing up his ideological commitments fails to get us very far. Like so many others in his sphere, he is doing what he's doing because it gets him attention, and attention can be converted into money. <laughs> so much of this is the natural conclusion of introducing an ego-driven bigot with a massive platform into a space where attention and money go hand in hand, and the profit incentive dictates so many major decisions that people make every day about how they conduct themselves. This is a coordinated maneuver by the far-right white supremacist media sphere, and while the damage it is doing may not be immediately preventable or reversible, the motion itself gives away the shape and function of the entire team and serves as a perfect opportunity for us to examine and explain how these fascists do what they do. The right-wing media sphere is not a monolith. It is full of backstabbing divas, grifters, and opportunists with no ideological cohesiveness, but all of them can see the neon-flashing dollar signs inherent to hosting Ye's meltdown on their platforms, which is why after watching Fuentes at the corner of their eye for years and keeping him at arm's length, they're all scrambling to triangulate their politics and, more importantly, their platforms around a campaign organized by Fuentes. They all watched Yiannopoulos circle the drain and fade into obscurity and bankruptcy over the course of half a decade, but suddenly, he got to go on Tim Pool. And then Ben Shapiro is running this narrative that I'm going to kill myself, right? And he's like, oh, due to his mental health, he's going to kill himself. That way, if they did um, attempt to kill me or kill me like they killed Michael Jackson or JFK, uh, then, or uh, Aaron, what is the guy's name? Aaron Carter, the guy who wanted to talk to me. Uh, uh, about the Harley passing next situation. If they did do that, they would say, oh, it's Ye's mental health. The ways that Ye is pressing to remove Ben Shapiro specifically from the right-wing media sphere also speaks strongly to the underlying purpose of what's going on here. For the last 20 years, in the Islamophobic climate of American patriotism and xenophobia after 9-11, the conservative media has worn the phrase Judeo-Christian values absolutely ragged. It was a nonsense phrase to begin with, but as a floating signifier, it served as a way to unite Christian identity conservatives with conservative Jews who supported Israel Israel, and more importantly, to reinforce the paternalistic philo-Semitism that defines the relationship between evangelical Christians and Israel. For the uninformed, radical evangelicals in America trying to bring about biblical prophecy or scripture have been supporting Israel based largely on the belief that relocating all the Jews in the world to Israel would be one of the criteria necessary to bring about the rapture. I know it sounds silly that they are trying to speed run the apocalypse, that they're trying to initiate a level skip that will take us to the final boss cutscene of the end of the world, but firstly, George Bush invaded Iraq talking about Gog and Magog, trying to appeal to this very evangelical base, and secondly, the entire Christian identity movement's politics functions around this kind of illogic. Either the prophecy is going to be fulfilled, and so they need to build up their militaristic strength to fight the army of the Antichrist, or it's not going to be fulfilled, and they need to build up their militaristic strength in order to make it happen. They have to make God's kingdom here on earth right now. That's the basic idea here. Also, to not leave it unsaid, Judeo-Christian values has always functioned as a white supremacist in-group signifier. There's white people, Westerners, Jews, Christians, us, and then there's them, P 
people who don't adhere to Judeo-Christian values. So the purpose in trying to push Shapiro out is part of a far-right realignment, trying to take the existing structures of the Christian identity movement that can currently uncomfortably tolerate conservative Jews and bring out their most explicitly anti-Semitic tendencies. It's not enough for them to be palatable to neo-Nazis anymore. Fuentes and his ilk have decided it's time for the cult to expressly embrace Nazism, and to do that all marriages of convenience to any conservative Jews have to be called off. As I commented earlier, Ye's anti-Semitism and conspiracy beliefs align closely with a school of thought from a group known as the Black Hebrew Israelites, but they're really a fringe group and not the focus of what I'm trying to talk about here. I want to talk about where those ideas come from, because it's a set of conspiracy beliefs inherited from the Christian identity movement that paints the group the conspiracy believer belongs to as the true lost tribe of Judah, and the Jews as the original chosen people who then lost God's favour after they rejected Jesus Christ. This conspiracy cult and its ideas are central to the beliefs that drive American Christian fundamentalism, using syncretic interpretations of history and archaeology to glue together a narrative that paints this current moment right now, from back when the conspiracy began in the 1800s, all the way to 2023 as the historic tipping point, the exact moment when biblical prophecy will be decided, and the talking points that Ye has been sharing from Black Israelite thinking is just one version of that. In Black Israelism, Black people are the lost tribe of Judah, the chosen people who will bring about the rapture. In British Israelism, Anglo-Saxons are the chosen people. And in Big Tent Conspiracy Theory QAnon, which unites most of modern conservative conspiracism into one nightmare collaboration, the chosen people who will make God's kingdom on Earth are Trump supporters. However... QAnon is a cult of self-justifying power, and their figurehead being sympathetic to the ultimate reality they live in is not enough on its own to keep them in the revered position within the conspiracy theory. So, ever since Trump left office, conspiracy theorists have been casting around for alternatives to lead their conspiracy cult. People call in surprisingly often to Infowars to ask Alex Jones if Trump has joined the cabal, or become compromised, or if he was ever on their side to begin with. See a sizable chunk of the cult, do listen to Jones, who, being a money-driven weather vane, has been flirting with the possibility of supporting other candidates besides Trump, if his audience is amenable to it. Despite the uncertainty inherent to all these far-right figures and their audiences waiting to see who the base supports before they all jump ship, the climate exists for them to pick a new leader. There is a considerable question to be asked about whether they'd be able to form consensus around making a black man that figurehead. But, whether it's Ye or someone else, the prospect of them replacing Trump opens up the possibility of a new agenda. Donald Trump panders to QAnon conspiracy theorists because he's flattered by attention. He's a rampant narcissist whose moral universe contains one person, but he doesn't know how to deftly use or control the social capital he wields as the messiah of a religious cult. People like Nick Fuentes, however, people like Gavin McInnes, I think have very clear ideas what they would do with that kind of power. Either they can install Ye as the leader, or they can just use the leverage he gives them to bring more explicit anti-Semitism into the collective consciousness of the cultic milieu, and doing that will set the agenda for the cult, because when the reality the cult exists within defines its membership, the figurehead has to adhere to the cult's agenda and the politics dictated by it, no matter what their personal beliefs are. They've already succeeded at bringing anti-Semitism to the table, but everything so far has been a pilot study. They want to see if the base will respond to it, and if it does, the people who appeal to that base will sell anti-Semitism back to them just like they already do with everything else they believe. We have to watch closely from here on to the anti-Semitic currents in American conservatism, because what happens next could affect the safety of Jewish people very negatively. Anti-fascist activists need to make protecting Jewish communities a high priority because the feedback loop that fascists engender when they successfully attack a marginalized community is pernicious. Belief frequently follows action in the human mind, and for fascists, the process of constructing justifications for their attacks on marginalized communities is a process of strengthening in-group identity. Idolizing the attackers, creating reasons for why the victims deserved it, even conspiracy theories that paint the attacks as false flags or hoaxes, all build a picture of a world where their cult is under attack for hating a marginalized group because that marginalized group is on the side of 
power on the side of the people puppeteering everything from behind the scenes, those people want to call you anti-Semitic. Those people want to call you a Nazi. They hate Nazis. But we love everyone. More than that, we need a leftism that is more than just reactive. I know that this whole video has been me reacting to and analyzing the actions of the far right, but I have to acknowledge and accept that that means that I'm engaging with politics on the back foot. Anti-capitalist politics need to be accessible to ordinary people so they can see the way that capitalism is harming them in their real life in a way that leaves no room for bigotry, because fascists can and will and do and always have incorporated anti-capitalist politics into the way they sell their ideas. And the only ideological defense to that is to give people an anti-capitalist understanding, a way of critiquing capitalism that blames no one except the ruling class. If people who are responding to anti-Semitism distance themselves from anti-capitalism, the politically ignorant are going to be open to being told that the problems in their life that actually stem from capitalism stem from the control of capital by a Jewish conspiracy. If the far right is going to consolidate power around attacking Jews, they're going to do it using misappropriated anti-capitalist rhetoric, just as they've always done from the very beginning. And the only ways to fight it are going to be by standing with Jewish communities in solidarity and defense, and by giving people a way out of capitalism that doesn't use a scapegoat. Everyone. Oh, I'm still recovering from that flu that's going around. Okay, um, I'd like to thank Patty Taxon, whose music from the album Agnes and Hilda I used snippets from throughout the video, as well as Ashenspire, a red and anarchist black metal band who you're listening to right now. They're great. Uh, check out their links below if you like it and go buy a shirt or whatever. It would help them out, and that would be cool. I'd also like to thank everyone who read the script, Feek and Lady Knight for sitting down to record interviews with me, my Patreon supporters for making this all possible, and you, the viewer, for watching all the way to the end. If you'd like to support my work, you can go to patreon.com slash sophiefrommars, and there are all sorts of tiers, and rewards, and so on, and so on, which is just lovely because I'm not going to be getting any ad money off this video, and I'm doing what I can to make sure that Tim Pool doesn't either. <laughs> so yeah, please check out my Patreon, it really helps a lot. I also do a show every Sunday from 8pm to 11pm UK time on twitch.tv slash redplanetlive called Red Planet, where I talk with some friends and usually guests about what leftists are doing to make the world an actually better and kinder place to live in right now, and you can find a link uh, to the Twitch and also the archived episodes below as well. So, uh, happy 2023 everyone! Uh, sad to start out on such a grim note, but I'm really hoping my next video will be much more purposefully positive and encourage a lot of people to get involved in leftist organizing. So until then, thanks for watching, and take care of each other. Bye for now! Yeah,